Have you been searching for the best ticket deals around? Well, look no further. With TixFlix, the price you see is the price you pay. And TixFlix just happens to have over $6 billion in ticket inventory just waiting for you. They absolutely mean it when they say every ticket, every venue, everywhere. And you can save even more with promo code PULSE in all caps to save you 5% off your total purchase. Just go to TixFlix.com and click the search bar. Search events based on your geographic location. Pick the show you want and BAM! It's showtime. Sporting events, Broadway shows, concerts, and more with TixFlix.com. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the email newsletter so you can stay up to date on the latest news and savings with TixFlix. That's TixFlix.com. T-I-X-D-L-I-T-Z.com. Every ticket, every venue, everywhere. Welcome to the continued podcast adventures of Superhero Speak. But I think many of the people that love this character and that love superheroes in general have used these stories as inspiration to say, you know what, I'm going to do something good in the world. I'm going to make a difference like my hero when I was a kid. That is my fondest memory of it because when, you, when you're doing comic books, you want them to affect people. Right. You want people to care. You want, you want to strike emotions. And I knew that that clone saga was striking a lot of emotion. Can you yeah. imagine Pulp Fiction starring Goofy and Mickey Mouse? I can totally imagine that. I'm Don't sure look, somebody's written that one too. Pounder with cheese in France, Mickey. <laughs> what? <laughs> Boy, ale with cheese, Mickey. Yeah. I can totally see. I, I, would, I would watch the hell out of that movie. Yes, I gladly saw, sacrifice that my, my progeny to you, of a mighty Marvel beast. <laughs> <laughs> But Neil Adams is somewhere going, hmm, it's, it's my time. <laughs> uh, how do you measure success? Hey, everyone. You're listening to Superhero Speak. And I'm your host, Dave. And John. And JD. Wow, very somber, JD. Are, are you okay? Oh. oh, I'm fine. Oh, okay, good. Um, I'm so, not a twat. No, no, apparently. But, you know. You can't have everything. So, so since since you're not a twat, how was your week, JD? Oh, I was pretty good. I'm all right. Everything's fun on this end. Everything's I was fun. Busy. Busy? I was Any, busy. Anything exciting? Anything you want to share? We have the. Uh, this is week one of Nerd Madness. Oh yeah. So, Yay! Is that what you're fishing for? Otherwise, I'm like striking out here. No, 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 no. I mean, so I guess you were getting everything ready for that. You're you're yeah. you're part of it. Okay. Yeah, I was I was doing my research, you know, making sure I had my my sweet sixteen and my regional drawn up. Uh, this will be uh, this will be interesting because I don't think Jade, uh, Jade, you are JD. I don't think I John's know. ready at all. Ready for what? Ah, uh, see, here we go. This is going to be I good. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> so, John, what have you been doing all week then? Apparently, ignoring you, but that's kind of normal. Um, eh, not really, you know. Um, caught caught up on all my anime. Caught up on all the CW shows, only to find out that Arrow's getting canceled. That's not, it's not canceled. It's ending. It's well, right. Ending. Everyone knew yeah, it was I ending. Mean, I mean, canceled ending. I mean, yeah, it's grace. It's it's uh, gracefully degrading. <laughs> but but what was interesting is that they're only getting ten episodes next season. That was the big announcement. Yeah, but that that might have been now that I've everything I've read that might have been you know they would have ended this year, but they wanted to fit it in with what was going on with the Crisis on Infinite Earth storyline. So, huh? I don't know. It, apparently, it was Stephen Amell who 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 wanted you know he's he's a, uh, a husband and a father now. And I think JD can attest that uh, you know that takes a chunk out of your time. What time? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, beyond, beyond that, I've been tracking those two Kickstarters that, that uh, I kept flubbing the uh, introductions for. Um, and uh, let's see, Hope, the Hope Kickstarter by Dirk Manning and Kaylin Smith, their goal was, <laughs> for some reason, 7777. Um, I guess that's because... Six 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 would have like opened up the portal of hell on Kickstarter. And, no, it's, well, it's just their lucky numbers. That's all. Yeah, well, well, they're, they're so their goal was seven thousand seven hundred bucks in, in change, and it's up to sixteen thousand now. 
Uh, and they've just, and I'm very happy because I, I donated and now we've got, we've got like the uh, $15,000 stretch goal just hit. He's got stretch goals up to $75,000. I don't know if we'll make it all, but he's trucking along. And then, uh, cool. Kit Steele's Tea Dragon stuff. Her, her goal was $2,000. She was admittedly a newbie for the Kickstarter. And, uh, she's currently, and remember, it was, uh, $2,000 was her goal. It's, she's up to 9,800 now. Cool. And, and I've actually talked to her and she's frantically trying to come up with new stretch goals because they, it stripped right past all the stretch goals she had. <laughs> That's the problem with the stretch goals is like people think it's just extra money that comes in, but it's not. You're creating extra product. Yeah. So I know a lot of kid creators that won't do stretch goals because it's like, it's deceptive. It's like, oh, look how much extra money it brought in. Yeah, but you gotta bring, you gotta give out so much more extra stuff. Well, it's just yeah. Yeah, yeah. The price. Yeah. Yes and no. I mean, look at the stretch goals for, for hope. And it's like the $12,500 stretch goal is, uh, an exclusive book plate illustrated by Kaylin Smith with every year. Okay. So that's a little bit of work for Kaylin Smith. She has to now do an, a, you know, a, a painting and, um, yeah, and make a, a that, book, but, that's t- but yeah. that's time. Right. But the next stretch goal, 15,000 is that they both sign it. Yeah. That was so, not quite so bad. Yeah. Yeah. So well, it, it I mean, looks like they, they it look, and I think Dirk did that on purpose though. I think he spread them out, you know, looking over these, it's like but, one, one requires the extra work that you're talking about. The next one is like, and we sign it or something like that, you know? Well, I think signing a thousand books in a timely fashion might give you a cramp to say it. Or oh, they're going to sign a thousand book. That's what it is. Yeah. That's well, fine, man. well, however <laughs> many they sell, right? I mean, yeah. yeah, the book plate in every one of those books. True. Yeah. yeah that's, that's the thing. That's time. Like, I was talking to uh, my buddy Russell Nolte, and he's ran. Man, I can't tell you how many successful Kickstarters he's ran. And at the end of the day, when it comes to, like, the number crunch and stuff, he's just not making enough money. Like, he does all right, but it's, like, with the with the volume, like, we're talking, like, you know, like, tens of thousands of dollars. I think he may have hit 100 grand on one. Like, it just, it, 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 what, what winds up being in the pocket is just not enough because comics is such an expensive medium. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, and when your stretch goals, like both, both Kickstarters had stretch goals of foil covers when they reached a certain amount. And they both blew past those. Okay. So we're, we're getting foil covers of Hope and this, this, uh, Tea Dragon, um, book. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. I, I got it. We can do a Kickstarter and our goals can all be dinner with John. Just so we yep. can finally get him a girlfriend. You, you, are, are you trying to have people you're, you're, they're going to be asking you to pay them money, not to pledge. It's more I mean, appropriate for a GoFundMe than a Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This is very true. I was just thinking of a petition, <laughs> maybe. Um, yeah. Right. Anyway, so, you know, just, just fun. Wa- it's really fun watching those. And especially like somebody like Kit who, you know, the newbie and, and seeing her re- or hearing her reaction is like, you know, she's aghast. Dirk, Dirk is like, eh, I can do better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fair to middling. So, uh, so I, uh, I've made a decision. I'm going to stop listening to certain podcasts. Did we talk about this last week? Yeah, I know. And I listened to them again and, and again, they had a news article on there. It was like, wait a minute, that sounds weird. And I heard this, but I thought it was a rumor. And I looked it up, and it's like, yeah, there's no confirmation on this, really. <sighs> the first step toward beating addiction is admitting you have a problem. I know, I know. I mean, okay, maybe you heard something different. But I looked on Variety and Wired. Um, so they want Idris Alba to replace... Will Smith as Deadshot, but it's not confirmed. That's just Warner Brothers' top pick. Right? Has anyone heard anything different about that? Nope. No, no. They're, they're pretty tight-lipped about that, I guess. Well, I mean, they said, oh, yeah, it's a done deal. It's been confirmed. And I'm like, I looked. I scoured the internet looking for it to be confirmed. And it was like, no, all the articles said that it was Warner Brothers' top pick, but there was nothing about Idris Alba saying, yeah, I'm going to do the movie. So, oh well. Um, I saw the trailer for the new Idris Elba Rock Jason Statham movie. It looks corny and silly, and I 
can't wait to see it. Uh, Calvin and Hobbs. I mean, Hobbs and uh, yeah, Hobbs and Shaw. Shaw. Yeah. The Fast and the Furious presents Hobbs and Shaw. It's going to be ridiculously stupid. Um, speaking of somebody who has never watched any of the Fast and the Furious movies, this one looks interesting to me. <laughs> I agree. I don't like many of them, but I like The Rock. So, you know, should be fun. Yeah. Um, oh, the other preview I saw, uh, we haven't really talked about it, is Brightburn. Oh, that's oh. cool. I, I don't even know if I'll watch that. It sounds... It, it's just it looks the it it looks brutal. Did, I mean, did it creep you out too much, John? It did. It creeped me out. Are you kidding me? Can you anybody who's anybody in comics has always thought, what if Superman really were just just freaking evil? And the answer is nobody survives, and yeah. and and not even in a you know nobody goes quietly and nobody survives. We've seen it in comics a bunch. Like the evil Superman in comics is is a trope. But in film, it's never been done. And this being a completely new property, one by James Gunn, I I don't know what to I, expect. I would I would I would argue, Superman three, we got an evil Superman. That was more like an <laughs> evil. That was like an evil director, evil writer. The less said about Superman three, the better. Yeah. Hey, his uniform was darker and his hair was slicked back. Come on. That's it did more- inspire. It did inspire the plot for uh, Office Space. There you go. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, yeah, I definitely need to stop. I need to find a, a podcast to replace it though in my my repertoire. So if you, the listener, have a podcast you listen to that I might not be listening to, let me know because I want to I want to find some new podcasts. Um. So, so let's talk a little social media madness here. Um, uh, keeping it short this week, I only have, um, really one or two here, main topic, uh, because this got a lot of feedback and, um, kind of shocked. So we talked about, you know, they, WB has officially said, like, the DCEU is dead. They're not going to worry about making connected movies anymore. They're going to be, uh, standalone. Ugh. Um, and we got some feedback on this. Uh, I was kind of shocked that, uh, the, the first one was a uh, friend of the show, Rusty Gilligan. Uh, they need to stay away from big stars and concentrate on CW network projects, cleaner and better actors, better shows. So, I mean, that's I, I, not going to happen. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Let's, oh, we'll just stop making movies. Yeah. Who likes money? I don't. Like I, think, money. I think what he's saying. <laughs> I think what he's saying is he enjoys the shows better than more than the movies. So he'd well, like to see them that. concentrate more on the shows. Right. So, uh, and then we but, had we had uh, uh, repeat offender Rob Foster uh, say, "Superhero films have peaked. Captain Marvel looks to tank." Avengers 4 will be a last hurrah. Then Marvel, Disney will go the way of DC Warner. All stars are at the close of their contracts. Everything is Green Lantern from then on, my honest opinion. To which JD said, hello, sunshine. It's a great gif. It took me like 10 minutes to find just the right smart-ass gif. <laughs> I put time into it. It's just so, I don't know, man. I mean, clearly that's true. Like, Captain Marvel uh, did terrible this weekend. Oh, horrible, horrible. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that in a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah just terrible, I'm sure. Right. Um, uh, which I replied to, with a gif. Uh, I don't know why I like this one, but it's a little frog sitting on a step, and it says, hello, darkness, my old friend. Um, Justin Miles uh, said, about time. It's okay to not copy Marvel. Shazam looks great, by the way. He's right. Uh, the United States Vampire Service said... God, I love these. I just... <laughs> they're going to focus on writing terrible, smaller, standalone films instead of writing terrible DCEU mess of films? Why not just focus on finding better writers? <laughs> I just find this funny that people think that the problems all come back to a writer. Like, yeah. writers are hired... And they're told this is what a movie is going to be. Unless they're doing something on spec, which means they're doing it on their own. Like, 
they're telling you. Like, a director comes with, this is the movie I want. Write the movie I want. And then, so, the the handle is K-Y-L-A-S-R-X-X, and her name is just two hearts, uh, replied, how can it be dead if they continue to make movies that exist in the same cinematic universe? She's not wrong. And it's That's true. Really, this is a legitimately good question. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to argue that point, but I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the point is they're not going to have connective tissue anymore. But yes, if 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 uh, Momoa continues to be Aquaman and um, Gal Gadot continues to be Wonder Woman, you know, they didn't change universes all of a sudden, right? Who knows? Um, oh, this is another one. Uh, this is where this is this is the good one. Uh, so the DCEU is crap. This was rusty. Uh, the wrong actors for most, <laughs> for the most. Feminism SJW runs rampant and no continuity. No real DC lives on the C- CW shows. The real DC lives on in the CW shows, but they are ruining that with Supergirl crap. They tried to follow Marvel and failed. <laughs> and then, hmm. you replied, yeah, screw part of my that feminazi Wonder Woman. <laughs> so I oh, just, that was me. I, I that just, was me. I just pulled the old, yeah, that was JD. I just pulled out the old classic Michael Jackson eating popcorn gif and said, okay, two wrestlers going at it. <laughs> and then you guys stopped. It was disappointing. Uh, oh. Wow. Matt had uh, chimed in with, it's a little disappointing, but it has... It, but so has the DCU been overall. Aquaman and Wonder Woman were definitely the standouts, and I actually like Man of Steel. I totally like to see another crack at Justice League, but with maybe James Wan at the helm. James Wan's a good director, but yeah. Matt, I love I love you, but Man of Steel. <laughs> Come on. Uh, um AJ O. Manson, comic writer. Uh, I think it's absolutely the better choice. That way they can finally do some really great innovative films without worrying about continuity. I've said that like 19 times on yeah. on these shows, and he just summed it up in two sentences. Yes. It's a good job. And uh, Cameron Khan, I love it. It's an amazing idea. So, so yeah, I mean, a lot of people have, have opinions on, on the DCEU, and, and it's uh, – I think it's safe to say it's one of the most interactive posts we've had on Twitter. Like every time that goes up, there's tons of responses. Hmm. There were more today. There were more today that got posted too. Like it won't die. Unlike the DCU. (laughs) And then of course we also talked about, this is the other real quick recap. We talked about Zachary Levi and him making a video addressing the fans about the Shazam, um, Captain Marvel quote unquote controversy. And of course, since we're talking about Captain Marvel, that's why I brought this in. Um, the Devil's Enemy, uh, no comparison, Shazam all the way. <laughs> uh, Gateway Comics, actual r- reviews from people who have actually seen the film, Boy Monster, are starting to come in. And so far, what I've seen has been positive. Okay. Uh, Ghost of the Stratosphere, the whole Marvel DC thing is beyond stupid. And the neckbeard rage about Captain Marvel is even worse. I am really excited for both of these flicks. I am more into Shazam because I am excited for DC film to finally be good, but I bet both are great. Screw the division. Pino Comics, I'm not excited for Cap, but only because it looks lackluster. And it's a character I never cared about. Those are the reasons to not care about a project, not because it has a girl in it. Uh, the Gorilla Brain Podcast, our new buddy and buddies in podcasting. Uh, we just aren't Captain Marvel fans, sadly. We just want, want the, we just want the scrolls. <laughs> I like to read though their, po- their tweets like they're, they're a hive collective. Yes. Or, or they're royalty, one or the other. <laughs> and finally, OJC. I think Zach was misinformed about what was happening and why. I think he is a classic guy. Generally speaking, with the way he treats his fans, I was less impressed with David Sandberg, who came across as a juice with his tweets. 
I don't know what that means, but oh, oh, good. I thought I was alone on that. I had no idea. I, what I don't know about. what David Sandberg did, and I'm not going to touch it with a ten foot pole. But thank you for the reply, OJC. Yeah, you know me. <laughs> um, and speaking of Gorilla Brain Pod, our our brothers in arms, uh, along with us and So Wizard and some other great pods. Don't forget, boys and girls, we are part of the Pulse Podcast Network, and we are proud members, and you should go check them out at PulsePodcastNetwork.com. And you know what? Let's take a moment to hear a word from them. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is 8-Bit Ray from the Gorilla Brain Podcast, part of the Pulse Podcast Network. Did you know that you could be using this spot to advertise your company or business? Well, I've done the research, and PodcastInsights.com report that podcast listeners are loyal, affluent, and mostly college-educated, but most importantly, are five times more likely to interact with the ad they hear on their favorite podcast than an ad from any other medium. If you would like to advertise your company or brand with our network, it's simple. All you have to do is send an email to marketing at PulsePodcastNetwork.com. I'll say it one more time marketing at pulsepodcastnetwork.com and we hope to hear from you soon all right guys so let's get to our first big topic of the evening we want to talk about nerd madness this is is our stab at uh uh getting in on the old march madness madness uh of course, we talked about this last week. We took four areas of fandom, anime, comics, TV, and movies, and uh, we all came up, we all took an area, we picked 16 from that area, we're going to present them now, and then we will have polls that are going to go up, where you guys are going to vote, and the winners will then be paired, of course. We'll have it, we'll, uh, JD's going to put together a bracket for us, and we'll, we'll put that on our website for you guys to follow, but... Uh, but since this was your idea, JD, why don't we make John go first? <laughs> because I'm there's no way I'm not because I would, John John's still making his sweet six his sixteen. I'll go first. I um, I, I completely flubbed this. I did. <laughs> so you had comics, JD. What did you yes. come up with? So we'll start at number sixteen. Um, I went in like I tried to focus. I, again, my focus was, you know, uh, books that primarily were out in 2018. Like I did storylines for the most part. And, um, some of them might have started in 17 or finished up in 19, but if they were in that general area, that's where my focus was. Number 16, uh, I made this my last pick because it's really, it's, uh, this is a Kickstarter exclusive book, uh, from a good friend of mine named Sean Manning. It's Macbeth the Red King. Um, you're not going to find it in a lot of the, the best of comics lists of the year. This was something that was, um, that I really quite enjoyed. From a, from a good friend and a remarkably underrated writer. It was a, a more of a historic look on Macbeth. Number 15 would be a book called Dark Ark by Colin Bunn. It's basically, you had Noah's Ark during the flood. And on the other arc, you have all the mythological and, and demon animals, we should say, like your <laughs> unicorns, your vampires. It's a great little horror book. Like it's, it's really, really cool. It's from Aftershock Comics. If you're not reading it, get into it. My number 14 seed was The Dreaming, which was a sequel to The Sandman, written by a really good British writer named Cy Spurrier. Um, creepy in some spots, really cool in others. Like, I think it, 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 it was the right guy and the right choice to, to continue Neil Gaiman's, um, seminal work. I picked a, uh, number 13, I picked a book called Infidel, which was kind of a horror, um, horror book in the, in the vein of, of, uh, Excuse me. Of Islam. Um, the less I say about this book, the better. <laughs> oh, just no. read, just read it. It's really, really cool. Number 12, I went X-Men Red, which was a Ooh. great return to the X-Men universe mm-hmm. this year. I was late. I read this this weekend. I read this one. I really <laughs> liked it because I was putting my list together and I realized, well, I didn't have enough for 16. So I, I opened up and I, I busted out the old Comixology Unlimited app and I was downloading stuff. So, uh, check this out. Nice return to form for Jean Grey. Just in time for that movie where they're going to kill her. <laughs> Number 11, Snagglepuss Exit Stage Left. We talked about this quite a bit on the yes. show. It was well worth the read. Um, it's basically Snagglepuss' Truman Capote. I highly recommend everyone read it. 
So number 10, a little bit of a, of a curveball, Claus, Claus and the Crying Snowman from Grant Morrison, my favorite writer of all time, uh, this continues his look of, of Santa Claus. If I could boil it down, it's basically Santa Claus as Conan the Barbarian early in his career. Read it. Number nine, The Immortal Hulk. I'm going to start. I'm taking up a lot of time, so I'll just rip through these last couple. Number eight, we did. I chose Venom by Donny Cates. We recovered a little bit some of the controversies going on, but Donny Cates is doing some really cool stuff with the Venom character, breathing new life into a character that, quite honestly, quite honestly, I felt was stale. Like when they announced mm-hmm. that Flash Thompson was no longer going to be Venom, they were going to go back to Eddie Brock. I was skeptical. I said, I'm not interested in this. I was wrong. Venom has been a great read. Number seven, I kind of did the all-encompassing. Black Panther books that came out in the wake of the movie. Tanahasi Coates, specific version of the character. Um, great book. A lot of political leanings into it. The perfect guy to write that story. Highly recommend this past year's Black Panther run. Number six, Dark Knight's Metal. Scott okay. Snyder's most insane book yet. I was it wondering was, when you were going to get to metal. <laughs> yes. Number, it was my number six choice. Um, I don't, it's, you know, I'm actually a little behind. I haven't finished it yet. It's, it's, it's I'm, I'm backloaded on it. But I really, really like what I've read so far of it. Scott Snyder had a fantastic run on Batman earlier this decade. And I think this is a nice little swan song for him to the character. It's nuts. Mm-hmm. It's it's the nuttiest Batman story I've ever read. And like I said, I love Grant Morrison. So highly recommend. Number five, I went a little bit of an oddball. The Comics History of Pro Wrestling by my buddy Aubrey Sitterson. Uh I love comics. I love pro wrestling. Aubrey does the unenviable task of telling the story of the history of a business that I love in comic form. Uh, Chris Moreno is the artist on it. And it's, if you, if you like comics and you love wrestling or you love wrestling and like comics, you're going to love this book. If you have no background whatsoever in pro wrestling, this is the best way to learn about why this business is awesome. And it is a business. Aubrey did a fantastic job on this. Number four, I went with Tom King's Batman. Like mm-hmm. it's been going on since 2016. In 2018, we kind of had the culmination of the the wedding storyline, the lack of yeah. wedding storyline between Bruce <laughs> Wayne and Selena <laughs> Kyle. Um, Tom King's a great writer. Like, and this is a lot of he does somber really, really well. And I think <laughs> this is a this is going to be a Batman story that kind of stands the test of time a little bit. Number three, I went with Chip Zdarsky's Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider Man. Uh, this again, another book that kind of started getting steam in 2017. Really picked it up in this past year. I'm a big Dan Slott fan. I know that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a point of discussion on this show between me and Dave, <laughs> but I like Dan Slott's run on Spider-Man. But that being said, when I first read Chip Zdarsky's version of Peter Parker, I felt like it was a breath of fresh air. He writes him differently. He's really, really funny. And, um, I really like the stories he did. I think that this book, I mean, I'm actually a bigger fan of, of this book now that, uh, that Slott's left Amazing Spider-Man. I think that Spectacular Spider-Man is the superior title, not to be accused of the superior Spider-Man. Number two, Brian Bendis' still burgeoning run on Superman. Um, Brian Bendis does Brian Bendis things. He's coming in (laughs) and uh, doing the closest thing I can compare this to for older fans would be when John Byrne came in and put his stamp on the character. Yeah, I like I like where it's going so far. Brian Bendis is one of the best character writers in comics. Like I think he does character moments better than any other writer in the medium today, especially working in primarily in superhero books. And I think that sometimes it's very easy to lose the character of Superman. And Bendis has been great at this his whole career, really getting to characters. And yeah, you get the Bendis speak and stuff like that, but I mean, it's, it's his thing. It's what he does. And I like that we get, you know, Clark and Lois back as they're feeling like people again. They're not just characters in a big overarching sweeping epic story. Like they feel like people to me. I mean, and that's such a thing in the industry that, like, that's a term I hear all the time. Bend to speak. You know? It is. Hmm. It's that rap, that rapid fire dialogue where you got the overlapping word balloons. It has mm-hmm. the pace of conversation. It's it's supposed to simulate the pace of conversation, but it's really like watching an episode of the Gilmore Girls. But that's <laughs> it is. That's how he writes. But it's cool. Like I, I like I really like his writing. Um, and I I like what he's done with Superman so far, man. It's been it's been great. I really want to see where it's going. And my number one. My number one seed in the comics regional is Tom King and Mitch Gerads, Mr. Miracle. This book huh. is really? different. It's awesome. Um, Tom King, I think, is the best writer in comics going right now. I'm not a, I'm not crazy on Heroes in Crisis, so I didn't make my list. Maybe when the story's done, I'll have different feelings on it. But Mr. Miracle, 
has really done something unique in comics. Tom King does this, like you have the Ben to speak we just talked about. Tom King has this, um, has this style of writing where it's almost dreamlike in some ways in the way he, he, he writes his dialogue. A lot of Mr. Miracle, the first couple issues are kind of hard to follow, but there's a genius to it. And it really is a book of, that's, it's, he takes superheroes and it's really a book about depression and relationships. And it's wrapped in this crazy dark side story. Um, if you enjoyed Tom King's run on the vision that he did a couple years ago and you've read Sheriff of Babylon and you like Batman, in my humble opinion, Mr. Miracle was the best thing in comics last year. So that is my number one seed. And for those who don't know who don't get sports, we're going to put this up in tournament format. The one will face the 16, the two will face the 15, so on and so forth. And you all can tell me why I'm stupid. Oh, well, yeah, I can, I can tell you that without putting it up. Um, you do it, you do it every week. Um, just number one, I love your list because you included indies along with, uh, DC and Marvel stuff. So, so great job with that. Um, I, I probably would have included more, but I mean, like, I didn't want to get them just trounced because I know a lot of people yeah. won't be familiar with it. So I tried to be as much, I tried to lean as much into what's mainstream as I could without, without just giving it, you know, stuff I didn't like. Right. And, uh, speaking of plugging things for friends, um, the metal. So those who are familiar with the metal storyline, uh, Harley Quinn is not in Batman metal. Oh. Uh, However, uh, when they requested a friend of mine, uh, Greg Horn, to do one of the covers, he did a Harley Quinn, right? Which people loved, but she wasn't in the story. And it was so loved that DC took his design from that cover and made a Harley Quinn statue, which I'm, I'm mentioning it because it is now currently available from DC Collectibles. Um, so yeah, you can get a statue for Harley Quinn metal who's not in the comic. So it makes for a fun little, uh, conversation piece. So, so you guys should check it out. It's a really cool statue. Again, DC collectibles. Um, that is really cool. <laughs> so, so, so John, did you get your 16 while we were talking or should I go now? 16 what? No. <laughs> <laughs> So Dave, you're yeah, up. Yes, I, I, I have. I, but go ahead, Dave. Uh, okay. So I had TV, and um, I, I mentioned it to the guys earlier this week. So I started with okay, sixteen. Can I get sixteen? So I said, let me just start with TV shows currently on TV that are based on comic books, and I got a list of like nineteen. Oh, <laughs> that's nuts! I didn't realize there was that many. Yes. Now, a couple of them... I thought them, there were more. <laughs> a, a couple of them are, you know, like like Lucifer is not a superhero show. You know what I'm saying? Well, um, but... So, so, basically, what I did is I did... I know, I know. Um, and there was a couple other ones that weren't on there. What I did is I tried to keep it to shows that I know we watch, we've talked about, um, and then... Um, I said, okay, I'm going to put them in, I'm going to do their seed order by, uh, popularity by ratings. So I took their average rating from last season. Problem is, is that I also included the Netflix shows. There's no way to get their numbers. So I kind of threw them in different spots as wild cards. If that, uh, if that makes sense to you guys, um, of course for me. All right. So I will do it like you did. I will start with the 16th and work up to the first. Um, at 16 is, of course, the one and only Iron Fist um, from from Netflix. Uh, 15 is uh, the show that everyone is currently talking about, and that's Deadly Class. Um, hmm. Have you guys Would watched you... it yet? It's actually really good. It, we talked it... about it never did it. Yeah. <laughs> I've been watching it, and it's disturbing. I mean, the writing is just that good that it's disturbing, and you still want to see it. Yeah. Um. Oh, 14, no. See, damn it. I forgot I left this one here, but it's too late. The list is done. I'm not going to change it. Uh, <laughs> 14 is American Gods, um, which is based on, obviously, the, the comic of the same name. Uh, 13 is Preacher. 
Uh, 12 is the Punisher. 11 is Black Lightning. 10 is Arrow. So, as you notice, uh, 10 is, you know, if, if I'm doing this in reverse order, it's pretty low. I was shocked when I saw what, what Arrow and Black Lightning's ratings were, but we'll get into that later. Uh, number nine, Legends of Tomorrow. Eight, Supergirl. Seven, Flash. Six, Luke Cage. And then five, Agent of Shield. Four is Gotham. Three is Gifted. Two, I had to make Daredevil because he's my all time favorite, uh, TV show. And can you guys guess what the number one show on TV based on a comic book is? Uh, flat? No. What? Hmm. I'll give yeah, you a hint. I, I, it's I been nothing. the number one comic book show for a long time. Oh, no. Not super freaking natural. No. Oh, it's not based on a comic, comic book. book. Oh, I didn't Jinx. know. I thought, it, I thought it might have been. You owe me a root here. <laughs> um, no. The Walking Dead. Oh, seriously? Still has amazing ratings. So... So there you go. There are my 16. So we shall see how Iron Fist does against The Walking Dead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I like your, I like your list. Yeah. Like I said, I, I mean, I did, yeah, I kept American Gods. Now I think about it. I did think about that. I kept American Gods and Walking Dead in there. So they weren't all superhero shows, but, um, no. I think it works. I think it works pretty good. Uh, I was wondering what, why your order was the way it was. I'm like, I didn't know Dave was a big fan of The Walking Dead as this, but it makes sense if you did it based off of rating or some perception of rating. It's exactly. cool. I like that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, again, I didn't know what Daredevil or, or Punisher or Iron Fist's ratings were, so I just kind of stuck them wild cardily where I kind of think they fit. <laughs> Netflix keeps that stuff close to the vest. Oh, yeah. All right, John. Did you come up with sixteen while we were talking? Yes. And I, I am realizing that a, I watch a hell of a lot more anime than I thought, and b, there is no human way possible to have covered all of the genres and all of the anime that has come out in the last, like, even two years, let alone last five. Well, too late. You have no choice. Do it. Fine. <laughs> Fine. So, so. All right, so going backwards, uh, let's see here. I guess I will start with Hinamatsuri. What happens when a uh, android comes, uh, goes back in time, and uh, appears in a mobster's uh, home and and becomes the mobster's kid? Uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Golden Wind, just because. Literally everything in anime these days is a JoJo's reference, um, and jo- and JoJo's has probably been is is one of the longest running uh, mangas ever. Uh, it's been around since the seventies, I think, eighties at the at the very least. So, uh, Sword Art Online, uh, Elysization, uh, That's because uh, everybody hates it. it, it you you are only one of two people. You either hate Sword Art Online or you love Sword Art Online. So that's in there for basically the people who will vote for it because they love it and vote for it because they hate it. <laughs> um, the Ancient Magus's Bride, which is a really interesting one. Uh, it's kind of uh, a bad guy uh, manga or anime about you know uh, a woman who sold as a slave to the Magus, who's basically the skull head guy. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm also realizing trying to explain these, I mean, to people who don't watch anime is like almost impossible. <laughs> uh, and, and, and uh, I'll, I'll go on. Sword Art Online <laughs> Alternative, Gun Gale Online, which was actually much better than Sword Art Online because it didn't have Kirito in it. Um <laughs> and and there there weren't any overpowered OP people just walking around just beating everybody. Um this next one I'm 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 just I'm not gonna explain it. Rascal does not dream of Bunny Girl Senpai. You you're just gonna have to look that one up. Um 
that's that's not a shonen or a tournament or anything like that. That's actually just a really nice love story, um, sort of. Uh, <laughs> as far as anime goes, My Hero Academia season three because it is killing it. It's been doing very well, um, and that's basically just how people become heroes. It's all yes. about you know one kid who is under, being tutored by his hero, who I won't say anything uh-huh. about what happens, and he goes on to become one of the... He, the end is supposed to be him becoming the greatest hero in the world. So, I, I see the commercials for that all the time and go, maybe I'll watch it, but... Oh, yeah. yeah. And there's cosplay all over the cons for it, too. Yes. So, you know, that that is, like, uber popular. But I'm... I, and I'm reading these by how much I like them, and it right. might be skewed towards my... You know, the things that I like. That's um, fine. That's what I did. And we'll let the people tell us we're wrong. <laughs> that's perfectly fine. Uh, and one of those that people are going to argue about is Goblin Slayer, which basically is um, it's an anime that on in the first episode, you have uh, basically goblins raping and pillaging people. And it shocked that the first episode shocked people. Um, but it was, it, the, the rest of the anime was awesome and that first episode set the tone and it needed, it, you know, I, I think it was artistic, uh, sort of. Um, Castlevania by Netflix, Netflix getting oh, into yeah. the mix here. And, uh, yeah, they, they, they tested like, uh, three episodes of the, this whole, uh, season. And it went very, very, very well. And so they came out the last part of the last episodes of the season and it killed it. It was, uh, it was actually good. People should watch that. Getting even better than that is Devil Man, uh, Devil Man Cry Baby. Now Devil Man be- has been around for a long time as well, but uh, every once in a while it'll pop up. Um, and in this case, it was, I don't know. It's, it's like, it's like the difference between a regular cartoon and a cartoon that's going for an Oscar. <laughs> so something like that. Uh, you, you'd have to see it. It's, it's pretty, that one's pretty graphic. Uh, and going from completely graphic to no graphic at all is Dragon Pilot, which is, uh, was directed by, uh, Hiroshi Kobayashi. And it is just, it's, it's one of those enemies like, okay, you know, I, I've, I've watched the bad guy trounce everybody. I've watched people's heads getting ripped off and, you know, and, and, and eating entrails. I just need a palate cleanser. And that's what Dragon Pilot is. It's just a nice little anime about dragons that transform into planes, specifically fighter jets. <laughs> you, again, you have to see it to understand. Alrighty. And then going back the other way, to Overlord 3, what if, what if, uh, in an anime you followed the bad guy and he was really bad, not like ironically bad, not, um, not, not, uh, you, you, he's bad, but you want to root for him, but just like, oh my God, can the heroes just finally run fast enough to get away from this guy? Um, Overlord is just, it's, it's, it's an isekai, but it's an isekai basically other world where a guy gets dropped into another world uh, and becomes basically the most evil bastard on the face of the planet. And when I say evil, I mean like just killing people left and right using them. And it's, 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 but it's very well done going. Uh, let's see. Next one on my list is mob psycho 100. Now mob psycho is written by a artist named one. That's his name. He also did, uh, he also did One Punch Man. And the, there's a, there's a kind of parody between the two, uh, the way he writes. It's an misunderstood character who, uh, is kind of out of regular society, but is so OP. No, and, and nobody, nobody realizes just how overpowered the guy is. So, and Mob Psycho is just fun to watch. Um, and it takes turns sometimes that you don't expect it to, but it's all, always kind of tugging at the heartstrings, which is, which is good. 
And then you get a, a really good fight with people with psychic powers that levels a, a whole city, which is nice. <laughs> Uh, the next one I got is, uh, again, this is another one where, you know, of course the title couldn't possibly have anything to do with the actual story itself. That time I got reincarnated by a slime. This is another one which is kind of a palate cleanser. It's You've, hmm? you've mentioned that one on the show before. <laughs> yes, yes. I I love this one. It is just It is just a nice little, another isekai where he's going through... Um, he, he gets, he gets, a, a guy gets stabbed, gets reincarnated in this other world as a slime, but as a slime with godlike powers. And it's, it's just fun to watch and it's a nice thing. And the guy, it's, it's, the, the guy playing the slime is just, he, he's trying to bring all the monsters together into a society where they don't fight. It's, and in, and the the trials and travails of that. Next one is Seven Deadly Sins season two because the Nanatsuna Taizai are just awesome, and some of the fight scenes in this are are just beautiful. Um, okay, do you have yeah. these numbered? Yes. Okay, you just haven't been saying the numbers. Oh, oh. okay. <laughs> well, that Nanatsuna Taizai that's number two. Oh, okay. I'm like, cause I, I'm like thinking, did we go over 16? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's because the, um, the, the titles are a lot longer than your normal. <laughs> that's true. Yes. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. I had Flash and Black Lightning and Punisher. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, yeah. Well, yeah. So, uh, and then lastly, I'm counting this as an anime. I don't care what anybody says. Go ahead. Argue with me. Thunderbolt Fantasy. Uh, because this is this is probably hands down, it was the most surprising show that I watched. And when I say surprising, I mean after the first episode, you're just sitting there staring at the screen, going, "What the hell just happened? And why is that so damn good?" And literally, that is what every single review I've ever seen of it says. It's like I I, I watched this on a dare, and now I can't stop. It's just that good. And it's all, it's all puppetry. Okay. I can't, I, I cannot explain it to you any, any more than just it's puppetry. I'm counting it as a freaking anime and it is just damn good. So I have so, no idea what you just, none of what you said made sense to me. I, I am shocked <laughs> that you did not include Dragon Ball Z at all on your list. Oh, that was, you know, I have that on my, on my like alternate list and that's only because it's just too, it's just too easy. Yeah, it's too commercial. It's, you know. I Every, mean, everyone I, would have voted for that. Well, yeah, Dragon Ball Z is like the free square on bingo, you know? <laughs> so, especially right. with Dragon Ball Super out. So. All right, so that is comics, TV, and anime. And then we have movies left. Yeah, I believe you took the first 16 and I took the bottom 16. You mean eight. That's what I mean. <laughs> so I, yeah, well, I, I, I thought this would be a discussion because I don't know if John wanted to bring any. So I brought eight just so that, you know, we could, we could discuss it. Um, these are all movies that came out last year. So I'll, 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 I'll start. And then, so this isn't, this isn't any particular number order. I'll leave that up to you, JD, when you put the lists together. All I'll, right? just refer, I'll just referee and tell you which one of you are wrong. Okay, so so um, of course I have Infinity War on here. Oh um, yeah, that's yeah. another free square. Yeah, that's a free square. Um, a movie that like we didn't we didn't really talk about on the podcast uh, much, but I did watch it and I really enjoyed it. Uh, Incredibles two. Um, Good flick. Yeah, of course Ant Man and the Wasp. Um, Black Good Panther. Flick. Black Panther. That's another free uh, square. Um, Deadpool two. Um, Ralph breaks the internet. Come on, people! No, seriously, really. You, if you want to boycott it, you've got to replace it with something. Stand I can, by. I, here, I, here I, my I, list, and then if you have something you want to contribute, we can debate. I mean, I, well, I was going to say I could, I could do, I could do Angry Birds, ironically, but 
<laughs> or, um, oh no, no, the emoji movie. There you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> go ahead, sorry. Solo, a Star Wars movie. And, uh, last but not least, Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, and I included Bohemian Rhapsody because those who saw the movie, I think, would understand where, uh, in the movie, uh, Freddie Mercury, played by uh, Remy Malik, talks about how Queen saw themselves as the outsiders, the rejects of society, playing to the other rejects of society. So, you know, I think that fits with our nerd theme. All right. Okay. Can, can't argue. Can't argue it. All right, I got my list. Um, again, the first one, I'm not, this might be our being number one. I don't know what you're saying, but uh, Spider-Verse. Okay. Yes. I yes. Knew you were, prob- I knew you were going to have that. That's why I didn't include it. <laughs> probably my favorite film of 2018. Uh, Mission Impossible Fallout, number two. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah. It was a good one. I liked it a lot. And I'm not a huge Mission Impossible fan, but that one really worked for me. And it was the uh, mustache that d- destroyed uh, Justice League. It was the mustache that really killed the DCEU. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. Paramount has had a rough year, but they can say they killed a franchise. Yes. I got a little different with number three. I went, uh, I'm a big horror movie fan, as you guys know, A Quiet Place, the John Krasinski uh, horror film. Ooh, okay. I refouled it up with Hereditary, another uh, small budget horror film that was just awesome. So I highly recommend that one. I've heard uh, really good things about that one. It's really good. Number five, I went Aquaman. Mm-hmm. And then uh, number six, Call Me a Wuss. I really liked Christopher Robin. Oh. I love <laughs> Winnie the Pooh. I got a little boy <laughs> starting to get me on that stuff. I, uh, I haven't seen that one yet, but I do want to see it. Tear Jerker. Yeah. Tear Jerker. I got back to my roots. Number seven, I went with a Netflix exclusive movie. Black Mirror, Bandersnatch. Okay. That's another one I've heard weird things about. Very, very weird, but awesome. And then number eight, uh, mm-hmm. I got a degree in documentary filmmaking, so I picked my favorite documentary of the year. This will be a 16 seed. Won't You Be My Neighbor, the Mr. The Mister Rogers <laughs> documentary. Ah, okay. About what a phenomenal human being he was. All right, that, John, this is that, your opportunity. Okay. For, uh, no, I was I was going to say the Mr. Rogers one. I forgot about that. That's like everybody should see that. Actually, yeah. it's that good. Yeah. So, what, what do you want me to do? I could. I mean, I mean, it, do you want to do add any? Do you want to boycott any? Well, you dispute. Tri- this is the play-in game, as we call it in the NCAA tournament. This is the play-in game. Which <sighs> movie do you have that you would like to challenge for a spot on the movie list? Uh, let's see. And you, you, you had these in the, um, this is in the email too, right? Yes. So, uh, mine's, mine's not. I, I put mine uh, together before sending an email. Dave did. Or, yeah. But I don't, you know. You, you I, seem like you wanted to challenge Ralph Breaks the Internet. Yeah, yeah. But you know what I'd, I'd challenge it with? How to Train Your Dragon 3. I knew oh. it. Oh. Second it. All right. Then I will concede. And we'll replace Ralph with uh, How to Train Your Dragon 3. I'm done. Goodbye. (laughs) (laughs) You can't leave yet. (laughs) So by the time time you hear this podcast, we will have the 64-man bracket released. And we will release – my thought is to do one regional every two days until the next show. Okay. And then we'll – we can go on and talk about the results next week. Yes. And and the plan is – to release the final results on our 300th episode. So, Believe it or not, that was a coincidence. That worked out quite nicely. Yes. Mm. All right. So now, now that we got that craziness out of the way, let us get to the main topic of the evening. An hour into the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's fine, man. We'll get a little bit longer this week. Um, but people are going to, people are going to want to hear, hear this. Um, of course, we're going to talk about uh, the one and only Captain Marvelous. Uh, <gasps> I'm outraged. I am bored. It is better. <laughs> it, <laughs> darling, darling, it is better to, to look good than to feel good. And you look marvelous. Um, what? 
Oh God, that's old. You enough. don't know uh, uh, Fernando from Saturday Night Live, Billy Crystal. You're pulling it there, man. You're pulling it from way back. Oh, I can't believe you don't know that reference. I'm a, All lot, right. I'm a lot, a lot younger than you guys. Uh-huh. I think you're playing dumb so you can look cooler. Um, Looking so- cool on this show is not an option. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to start like we always do real quick. We're going to go by the numbers. Uh, the box off opening box office for the weekend, it made 153 million domestically, uh, 302 million, uh, overseas for a total of 455 million on its opening weekend. So, uh, it's suffice it to say that it was a success and, uh, we will probably get a Captain Marvel too. Um, uh, as of when I made this email, because the scores keep changing, uh, the Rotten Tomatoes critic score was 80%. The audience score was 58%. And last but not least, we asked our audience, we did a poll today, um, what did you think of Captain Marvel? Let us know. We'll discuss the results on the next Superhero Speak. I gave them four options. Uh, one of the best in the MCU was the first answer. It was okay, I guess, is the second answer. Um, it was terrible. And who, question mark, bring on Shazam. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, and it, it, uh, of the, the, the least answer, the, the, the smallest percentage, 8% want to, it was terrible. Uh, 25% said who, bring on Shazam. And a tie was between at thirty four percent between uh, one of the best in the MCU and it was okay, I guess. Um, and then we had some discussion on this. Uh, we won't go into all of it because uh, <laughs> we talked about it before we started. Uh, Ghost of the Stratosphere said top ten MCU flick for me, not the elite, but pretty darn good. Uh, Take a Knee for Marvel and DC said, It was good, not great movie, definitely enjoyable, and a welcome addition to the MCU. I don't know what it means to that Captain Marvel herself was my fourth or fifth favorite part of the movie. Uh, Code Name Roy, don't forget, I will also want to watch Suzanne. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You're, you can go see that one too. You're allowed to see both, Code Name Roy. We won't stop you. No, you must pick sides. Um, Golden State Comics. Uh, I found it fun and pretty good overall. I have some gripes filmmaking wise, but nothing major. But also, I cannot wait for Sazam either. Uh, Timothy Jones, a great beginning to the future of the MCU. Marvel was a lot of fun. If anyone, a movie was a lot of fun. If anyone can take on Thanos, it's her. Mid and end credit scenes are vital. Um, listener Skiznot said it was solid. And I will stop reading the tweets right there because... There's too many of them? No, this is where um, somebody um, got involved who was basically trolling us, which I don't know why this person was following us in the first place. Um, but I will say to Ed, uh, Emerald uh, Centurion, uh, shout out to you for, um, you know, trying to come to our defense. Uh, basically... We just blocked the person and we're done with them. So we'll leave it at that. All right. Um, so let's do what we always do. Let's go around the room real quick. Uh, initial thoughts without any spoilers. And we can start with JD. Liked it a lot. All right. Short and simple. <laughs> I mean, no spoilers. I mean, like, I liked it. It was good. I enjoyed uh-huh. it. All right. Uh, John? It was damn good. Oh, okay. Another, <laughs> another go. short and simple. <laughs> All right. I will say, of the 21 films in the MCU, this is one of them. Um, so, oh. <laughs> um, no, it was, it was, it was, it was okay. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I do think people should go out and see it. So, so I think the overall consensus is that uh, people should go see this movie. If you haven't, at this point, there will be spoilers. Uh, so if you don't want the movie ruined for you, which at this point is probably not going to happen, um, but if you don't want us to ruin it, then just stop listening and wait till you see the movie and come back and listen. Um, 
if you don't care about spoilers, all right, here we go. Uh, so where to begin with this movie? Um, I just want to, I'm going to start off with like, there was a lot of trolls, we'll, we'll call them out there who basically were hating this movie without seeing it. And it basically based on comments made by, uh, the lead actress that, that they didn't agree with. And I think that's a stupid, we've, we've talked about this on the show already. That's a stupid reason to not like a movie and, and attack it. Um, and this is the movie that finally broke Rotten Tomatoes with the, um, pre, was it the, the, the pre viewing or whatever the, that was the, that was the mouse stepping in. Let's be honest. Um, but well, yeah, but that's what it took, you know? Um, but, uh, um, as, as you like to say all the time on the show, John, about the four quadrants, uh, Disney is the master of the four quadrants. And I knew that even if there was a little bit of yay girl power in it, it was not going to be overwhelming, uh, in this movie. And it wasn't like, nope. let's be honest. If you are, if you are sitting there seething right now, Oh, Captain Marvel sucks. Because it's a it's a it's a, a a feminist movement movie. You're an idiot. Go watch mm. the movie. There's yes, there are yay girl power moments in it, but that is not what the movie is about. So they're the same. They're the same um, moments that every hero has, basically. You know, I think there's more feminism type moments in Wonder Woman than in this one. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I'll <clears throat> also say that I think all of the actors in this movie were really good. I think the visuals are um, well done, uh, but I didn't like the script. I'm going to be completely honest. I had issues with this, with the script of this movie, with the story. And uh, it was just like, and, and let me explain that, right? And, and, and you guys can and, uh, rebut to this. Um, like, I understand Um, they took, they tweaked her origin story slightly, right? But the problem is, is it felt rushed and shoehorned in specifically so that they could have, uh, Captain Marvel in Endgame. And that was the only thing. Like, I feel like she could have had a much better movie if they took their time with it. And I felt let down by it. What do you guys think of that? I've never disagreed with anything you said more. Mm. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you, JD. Okay. So, 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 okay. I didn't, so I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> feel, I didn't feel anything rushed. I really didn't. I didn't, I, so it seemed to me like this was a plan for, it's not like they made Endgame go, dude, we got to get Captain Marvel in. Like they don't rush movies. They've been planning on doing this stuff for a while. You okay. Know? But I just, I don't feel like, I don't feel like she had, uh, a story, an, an arcanist, like they're like, you look at Iron Man, the first Iron Man movie, and you look at the, the, the character arc that Tony goes through from the beginning of that movie by the time he says, I am Iron Man at the end. And even Captain America and Doctor Strange, like there are strong character movies. I kind of feel like a bunch of stuff just happens to Carol Danvers. I don't see that. Me neither. Okay. I mean, I mean, I, let, let me, cause, I, I will tell you that my own my only gripe with the movie, and it's not really a gripe, it's more like a you know purposeful suggestion, is that um, at the end they did play up the her you know getting up after being knocked down and finally going full power and all that, and I feel like they might have been missing a scene or two that would have made that perfect. Exactly. But, but 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 there was, was no but, connective tissue for no, that to the rest of the movie. It did but there not, was there was some connective tissue, but I feel like they could have made. But that but the rest but of the movie like, was just fine. It's not like it's not like Captain Marvel was struggling throughout the movie, and then that was her moment where she finally like was was got up and like got past all her struggles. Like she wasn't struggling in in what was happening to her in that movie. Like. There was struggles in the flashbacks, but they weren't connected to what was going on currently in the story. Disagree. Um, the yeah. struggles she has is not knowing what she is. The struggle of Captain Marvel isn't the, isn't the same kind of character arc 
that that uh, we've seen from the earlier, specifically the earlier MCU movies. The character arc in this one is believing you're something and finding out everything you believe in is a lie. It's a different kind of movie. It's a different kind of story. That is that is her struggle. It's not, and this is why I think a lot of people assumed it was going to be like this whole girl power, you don't think I can do it kind of thing. And there is a little bit of that, but they don't beat it over your head because the most, it's, it's not a female dominated movie, but there's a lot of females that play major roles in it. Like, I think that the arc in this movie is more, I don't know who I am. And I have all these great things. I don't really know what they do. I don't know what I am. Like, I can do all these things. But what am I? And I think the story of this movie is really about challenging a perception. And it's not so much of a I need to get up story. It's a great moment in the movie, but it's it's the crux of it is the crux of that scene isn't I have to get up because everyone's been holding me down. The crux of that scene is I have to get up because I finally figured out who I am. Which in in that case, it was her realizing that part part of the reason why they've been telling her all along to control your emotions and and you know don't use your power as much as she could was i think you get the feeling that they were hiding from her the fact that well, she was so powerful she could basically wipe them all out so, right so so and then so here's something else and this i don't think this is nitpicking where i feel people might say that it is it was, is no sorry go ahead what what <laughs> Was she an idiot? Does she continue to get hit in the head with a coconut? Why on earth did she never question, how come I'm the only one who has powers? Because why they've been telling her all along that, that they gave them to her. Right, but right. why didn't it, like, you're fighting a war, and these powers would help if everyone had them, you know, or at least a band of soldiers had them. Why because is she the only one in six years? Why is, okay. Why well, yeah, but... Okay. Why does Jude Law also look like a human, and she right. does too? But, but Why are, yeah, like there's a lot of questions that because could, that 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 is all canon in the comic book. There are white Cree and there are blue Cree. That's that's, that's never, all in the comic that's book. Never, ex- but that's not in the movie. But I'll that's, but I can look past that. Like that that doesn't need to be explained. <laughs> that does need to be explained. Everyone else is blue, but it is with the question. exception of those okay. two. But then why but doesn't she question but, that? Because it doesn't make doesn't matter. Do you know it's brainwashed? She's brainwashed. Yes, yeah, and that's the thing. She's only got what five years of memories to work off of, right. so she doesn't. That's, she hasn't. She didn't have the experience again to question it like you would after you know not having your brainwashed. And she's a soldier. Soldiers are taught like as part of yes. being a soldier, you don't question authority, mm-hmm. which is leads to the thing of questioning authority. That's however, that's a common trope in a movie. In a soldier however, story. again, connective tissue where. They show her in her in the, in the flashbacks, um, uh, going against the grain, and she's a and different person doing her. But she's still that person that's still in her. No, but that's but that's the point. Is like, of course it's in her, but she's fighting it. Now, see, that she's doesn't work for me. I'm telling you, that doesn't but it, work for me. I, I appreciate that it doesn't work for you, but I'm telling hmm. you that it's also there. Like she's fighting who she is. She doesn't know what she is. And that's the whole thing is it's not like I have to overcome. It's who am I? What is my purpose? And then she finds out what that everything she believes in is a lie. That's the story of this movie. Like if you woke up one day and you had no recollection of what you are, but you had all these powers. And everyone says, oh, yeah, you've always had those. You would go, oh, OK, I always have these. It's like if you were to wake up tomorrow and you were six foot six and you say, mm-hmm. I don't remember being six foot six. And everyone around you goes, dude, you've always been 6'6". Six, six. What's your deal? You would kind of go, oh, I guess I'm 6'6". Six, six. We as human beings accept the reality with which we are presented. Especially when we are presented this knowledge from people that we trust. That is literally the, that is literally a big crux of the movie. Is the people that she trusted that lied to her. That's imagine no, I, like if you were if you wake up tomorrow and you find out mom and dad aren't mom and dad. That's you know, right. It's the same right. thing. Which is also which is also a big part of um Winter Soldier, I get it, but I don't know. I didn't. It didn't feel like it was enough to carry the the movie. See, it, again, that was the that my that was my only thing about it was that they, it felt like maybe there was one, two, or three scenes that you know are probably going to be in the in the DVD when it comes out um, because the movie was long. That uh, you know, 
that that would basically bring all that together perfectly. But otherwise, yeah, they, they're not. These are not concepts that uh, movie watchers are unused to bridging themselves. Yeah, especially especially when it's an ideal thing of her not knowing her past. All right, so, right. so so let's 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 uh, let's tackle this a slightly different way too. What was your? Let's start with JD. What was your favorite yeah. thing in the movie? Favorite, my favorite. My favorite thing in the movie is the interaction between Fury and her. I think they have really good chemistry together. I think their their stuff plays really, really well. I also like the relationship a lot between uh, Captain Marvel and the future Captain Marvel. <laughs> if they do that. Uh, they probably will. There's a reason she's in there. You know, that's, or, that's, or, you know. or they'll make her Pulsar. Who she or, is. or Spectrum, right? Or fo- Photon. She said something. I'm sorry, Photon. Okay. That's it. But she was but also yeah. Spectrum, yeah. Yeah, she's had a lot. I mean, like, Monica Rambeau is a big character, and they, I like how they included her, but I think that the little girl they had did great. I also really like that they didn't do a love story, that she has no love interest in the movie. Yes. I think that uh, it's, quite frankly, a little demeaning to say that, oh, women need a love story in a movie, and I like that. It didn't even occur to me after the movie was over that there was no hint of, like, a love story or sexual tension or anything like that in the film. Well, she, she, did, look, she did look at Fury a couple of times, and... <laughs> Yeah, he's already old by this point. You know, he's old then. If I could complain about one thing, it's the flurkin took his eye. That I was like, okay, now you lost me. But that's a minor quibble. Right, well, we'll get to the flurkin in a minute. Um, how about you, John? What was your favorite thing about this movie? Oh, the flurkin. I want one. I like my cats, but if my cats could grow tentacles, it would be so much better. <laughs> no, um, no, I agree. Like, uh, the, uh, the on-the-road... Uh, comedy act uh, between Fury and Captain Marvel was uh, was pretty good, and and how th- how it grew to the point where they trusted each other, you know. It's and it seemed like that was a point in Nick Fury's life where he was a lot more open, so he could make a friend like that. Whereas in the present day, nobody knows him well enough to be his friend. Yeah, yeah, he's less snake bit in this movie, which makes sense. You know, we're all different 25 years than what we were 25 years ago. I kind of yeah. like that. Which which means that it's going to be interesting in the in uh, Endgame if they bring Fury back for any of it that uh, that you'll be able to see a camaraderie between those two that the others won't share, and it's gonna it'd be they could play that that pretty interestingly, I think. Um, mm. okay, but uh, but otherwise, yeah, no, uh, and and the chemistry between her and her friend. Because you know that's I don't know kind of kind of tugged on the heartstrings there. Like you know my friend's been gone for five years and you just show up and now you're you've got amnesia and you know why don't you remember me and that sort of thing. Like you know that that wanting to reach out and not being able to yet. Um, and and then uh, yeah that that was that was pretty. I there was a little thing. This this is my thing. Um, mostly because you, this is something you kind of see in a lot of the animes. Uh, where it's that the, when she finally realized the kind of power she had and like, you know, that, 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 that smile that she got when it's like, Oh, Oh, that's right. I know a cheat code to all this. (laughs) And then went up and started just destroying everything. It's, uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Yeah, me too. I like the whole, what it means. Like you're more than you think you are. That's a great yeah. lesson for anybody, is you can do more than you think you can. Even if you think you're capable of a lot, it turns out you're capable of more. I think it's cool. That's a cool moral for a, a superhero movie. Mm. All right. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think, uh, like, I liked Brie Larson in the movie. I think Yeah, she, me too. She, like, that, she did a great job with what she was given. Um, you know, like... For what she was going through, she she did a good job of portraying somebody struggling with uh when she was starting to get her memories back. Like, like I I I look forward to her to her in other movies. Um, you know, at, at this point, other MCU movies. Um, I I kind of like the chemistry between her and and Samuel Jackson, but at the same time, being a long time Nick Fury fan, both. 
original and ultimate. Uh, I don't like him being relegated to comedy, you know, comedy relief. It wasn't just comedy. It was that was a time before they even knew that aliens existed, let alone had started thinking about really yeah, but- having to deal with super powered beings. So. You know, it, he and again, like JD said, that you know he he was vulnerable back then. He's just open. He's you know not jaded. So you but, know, but there there really wasn't a time like that in Fury's life. <laughs> different Fury though. Mm-hmm. It's different. These guys, these aren't the. I mean, like these aren't the comic book versions of the characters. You know, yeah. Bucky Bar- Bucky Barnes wasn't Cap's teen sidekick. You know, he was the guy that actually took care of Steve Rogers. When, and, and that was that's a pure movie invention that's actually helped strengthen the bond that they have in, in this film. In these films, I should say. You know? Star yeah. Lord Star Lord isn't the son of Jason of Spartax. He's the son of Ego. I don't you know. know. Like, I just Nick, I like I like Nick Fury as the badass. I don't like you know and which which leads me to another again, going back to some of the issue I have with some of the writing in this movie is I feel like there were times, and I this is I know this is the newer MCU movies rely more on humor than some of the other ones. But I felt like at times they sacrificed having a explaining a plot point as for a cheap joke. Um, case in point, when they're in the bar, and she's like, "How do I know you're not a a, a scroll?" And he's you know starts saying things and telling, giving a back, you know. Interesting things in his past that that works, and he goes, "How do I know you're not a scroll?" And she shoots the the jukebox, <laughs> and it's like, I'm "Sorry, that was funny." No, yeah. it was stupid. I rolled no, my I eyes at it, it because funny. it's like, number one, Nick Fury doesn't know. Number one, Nick Fury doesn't know that scrolls can't shoot photons, and guess what? She's the only Kree that can do it, and so, she doesn't. Yeah, but. <laughs> But that he doesn't also, prove a thing. And if you can also, copy down to the DNA, then how do you know they can't copy of shooting photons? But that's the thing is, he says I wouldn't know that. That's literally the line he says in the story. Like, I that's know, and that's why, said. exactly, I rolled my eyes and then he said it. It was just like, yeah, it was, I don't know. I, I, well, I think, But again, she's at that point, she's really the outsider and assumes that, like she lands on Earth assuming that everybody knows what's going on in the outer in she doesn't, lack of yeah, she, the doesn't, rim. she doesn't realize how bumpkins we are. Right. Like she gives us more credit that we deserve as far as you know knowledge of alien races go. Like like I like that. I think that's I think that's a nice little character moment. Is it also shows how kind of trusting that she is and susceptible. I suppose. I don't know. I, I just I guess I didn't connect with the story. That and and it's you know that it it just bothers me. Um, Fair enough. Okay. You, you are allowed to not connect with it. I feel you. Um, mm-hmm. I guess it's also like I, what it really comes down to. And again, I enjoyed uh, aspects of the movie, but at the end of the movie, right? Like, put yourself in her shoes, right? You, there was an accident. She she wore boots. There was an accident. <laughs> you got these powers, but lost your memory. You were fighting in a war for six years um, that, you know, because you were being used by one side. It really wasn't your war. And um, you find out at the end who you really are. Your memories all come rushing back. Like, I understand. Look, I understand the sense of obligation of helping the scrolls at that point. But the never coming back in 25 years? She says that I'll be back soon. It's also possible she don't know how long she's been gone. Plus, you know. noticed the lack of aging. Yeah. she For her, it, might, it suits a little different. The hair's a little different. But, I mean, like, she doesn't look a day older. So, I mean, it could be. she. I mean, she didn't have the one. She's going to be like, I've been gone for how long? Like, that's what's <laughs> going to happen in the next movie. And that's easy to predict and call that what you want. But, I mean, like. And it's one of those things, man. Like you go off to do something, and it takes a lot longer than you. Man, I tell my wife I'll be back in fifteen minutes, and an hour flies by. <laughs> yeah, not twenty five years, though. But I'm not so thing. But it could be. Like, who knows where she's been, and what she's. And, ha- I mean, like, and I and I've, I I've actually said this to a lot of people I talk to. In my personal opinion, 
and of course you're going to lose some of the 90s jokes that were in the movie. I think the movie works better if it was 2005 instead of 1995. Because uh, then it's have, it's right before afford. it's right before Iron Man and all of that starts up, and it's a little bit easier to swallow. She was gone for fifteen years than twenty five. I don't know. I mean, it's hard for me to make that call until I see what they do. If if Endgame there winds up being giant holes, then I'll I'll agree with that. But I mean, like they rarely miss fire in these movies, and I think there's a reason that they chose. The, the 1990s. 90s. I mean, and we don't entirely know what that is yet, and that's fine. These movies, these are the, my big complaint about these movies is they, they can't be watched in a vacuum, right? No, this no. Is as close yes. as, this is as close as we come sometimes to getting a movie in a vacuum. Like, I, I can't. I, I can't that's say. The thing. I, I know for felt, sure. I almost felt like they said it in the 90s so that it could be standalone in that aspect. It could be. It could be. But I want to see like where it goes. Like we got a younger. It, it's it's far enough away where there leaves some opening. Yeah, and I said before on this show that I want a Fantastic Four in the '60s, out of this, out of the, yeah. out of the, some way of the MCU. So I mean, like, I'm okay, I'm okay with it for now, but I want to see why. I want to know the reasons why. Why did it have to be 1995? Well, I'm, right. I'm willing to just, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to hold out till the next movie comes out and see why. Okay. I mean, those are unanswered questions, but we get those with these movies. Okay. Like the the last one was the biggest cliffhanger in history where they killed Spider Man. I mean, like. Hmm. Like I just I, I want to bef- before I poop on that idea, but I'm not saying you're wrong because you could be 100 percent correct. I just want to give him the benefit of the doubt before I agree. Okay. And um, what did you guys think of the retcon of the MCU that was in this movie? The shield thing. Yeah. Well, there's yeah, there's two retcons in it. The the first one obviously being that's the big one. Them calling themselves Shield when. They don't, when Coulson says, oh, we're calling ourselves S.H.I.E.L.D. for the first time in Iron Man 2. Right. I caught that. Because what's, I can't think of, I don't know why, I can't think of the name of the agency that Carter was from. Yes, SSI. SSI, thank you. SSI. Why couldn't they be SSI? You know, Uh, because he's also flashing the S.H.I.E.L.D. badge around like people know what they are, too. And no one knew what who Shield was in Iron Man one and, and and so on. Well, maybe they'd gone underground by then. We don't. Yeah, again, there's enough. There's a lot of because there's a big time gap. There's a lot but, of wiggle room. But again, Coulson was there, and mm-hmm. he's saying Shield, and then he acts like in Iron Man two, it's the first time they're calling themselves Shield. So it was kind of like that. The, it, you, you get why you could have made jokes about them saying the full name. Well, we're yeah. I mean. Okay. And then what's the other what's the other one? The other retcon is the other retcon and and I know people are gonna argue with this is the how um uh they end up with the cosmic cube I'm sorry, the the, the Tesseract. Oh I I got a question on this one. Go for it. I have a theory. I know what you're talking about. Because he I've, says I've in Avengers, about this. <laughs> he's because uh, uh, Fury says in Avengers that that Howard Stark dug up the Tesseract. And so your assumption is Howard Stark, gave, they got it from Howard Stark. Uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. got it from Howard Stark. So how did it end up on uh, Marvel's floating laboratory? Question, okay, okay. I've seen this, and I didn't read that with the way everybody else did. When I first saw that, my question was, where did they come up with another Tesseract? Because that last scene, Nick Fury is at an empty desk. I truly think he has had an empty desk because he's already been eliminated. And that he bar the cat bar or the furlack for, for what they call it? For, I forget what it's called. The cat barfs up the, the tesseract now. I don't think that's the original tesseract because I was doing the same thing. I was trying to do the mental leaps to make it work. I think no, that's but, a different thing. No, no, no. That wasn't, that wasn't a, no, if you looked at the monitor, that was still, that was only a, like a, probably a few days later or something. Was it? I mean, like yeah. until, until, I don't yeah, know. Yes, yes. I no, I, that, my eyes went right to the monitor to check I, I and see what too, type it was. It is, it's a CTR yeah. monitor. It's not a flat panel monitor. CRT. CRT, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, I, I thought that too. And it's like, no, that is, that's definitely a 90s office. Yeah. However, well, however, however. however go for it. It's a different color monitor. He has a white monitor when he's sitting there typing. 
And in that after credit scene, it was a black monitor. So it could be later on at some point, but it's now, still like late 90s, early 2000s. When they find the Tesseract, I believe is in Thor, they find the Tesseract the first time. And it's at Project Pegasus. Right. So I believe so. It could have been a simple fact of Hard Stark digs it up and Marvel gets it from there. From, uh, because from of, Stark, yeah. Or from Stark. Like that. There's holes in it. I'm still not entirely sold that it's the same Tesseract. Flurkin. To be quite honest. Flurkin, thank you. <laughs> I'm not entirely until until proven wrong, I reserve the right to question the validity of that being the only Tesseract. Right. So and 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 this is this is a discussion actually I would say. Oh, um sorry, just just one thing. If that is a second Tesseract or the same one but from a different time that could hint at some really gnarly um, storyline plot threads through Endgame. Could be, because we talked about time travel. So when time We know it's going to be time travel, yeah. Right, so with time travel on the table, like, I don't, I think continuity questions are kind of up in the air, because I don't know. I mean, like, it it doesn't, there have been more than one Cosmic Cube. If it's a Cosmic Cube. Hold on, wait a minute. (laughs) Oh, shit. There's a there's a rumor that uh, the, some of the plot le- uh, points were leaked for Endgame, and that when um, Ant Man uh, Scott Lang comes out of the quantum realm, he ends he, while he's in the quantum realm, he ends up into a, a time I forget what they call it. Uh, let's say time vortex, but so and he ends up coming out of the quantum realm. In the eighties, hmm. fun stuff. So, could there be something where he runs into Shield and he says Shield? It's possible. Which, oh god. Anyway, it's pos- like it's possible. Like these guys, they don't make a lot of these mistakes, and because if it was, if it's like comics where different people are writing and retcons and stuff happen, I would just chalk it up to well, you know, shit happens. But I mean, Kevin Feige keeps a pretty tight lid on these things, and if we know that time travel is on the table for the next one, using the cosmic cube would make sense in how they get how he gets back. Right, and actually, I was having a conversation with someone about this at work too. I believe originally that the uh, the plan for the Tesseract when they introduced it in the first Avenger wasn't it was housing the Space Stone. I believe. The original plan was that was going to be the Cosmic Cube. It is the Cosmic Cube. They just call it the Tesseract because it mm. sounds a lot cooler than Cosmic Cube. Okay, but the Cosmic Cube is holding the space, the space stone, right? So yes. it's like that's a weird thing that never happened in the comics. No, yeah. Hmm. Well, let's say they do their – they kind of – well, like all comics. Like if you read comics from the 90s, they don't quite mesh up with what they are today. Like people were retcon- – we're in a constant state of retcon. This is you true. Know? This is so really I, true. I, I'd like to I'd like to not harp on the continuity things until the time travel movie is done. Until end game, right. I get yes. it. At that point, if there's still big holes, I'll be the first to go, yeah, they're wrong. Crucify them. Like But until, until then, I'm gonna hold off on that. I'm still not sure when that cat barfs up that cosmic cube. Um Oh, uh we didn't talk about this, um, uh, but at the at the very 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 beginning of the movie, did you guys feel like you were kicked in the gut? The very very beginning of the movie, like when you talk about how the movie starts. Yeah, with with the logo. And oh the- yeah, the Stanley. Oh, yeah. That was so awesome. I got teary eyed, and I yes. didn't see it coming. Yeah, yeah. that yeah, was awesome. My son looked over at me when he saw it. Yeah. Because he's like, oh, my dad's gonna cry. He knew he was thinking that. <laughs> how about the how about the actual cameo? Yeah, that was interesting. Um, I, I kind of wondered, um, why didn't they de-age him? I don't know. They did it for everyone else. Why? That's a good question. Probably because they didn't think to. Or maybe they thought it was a little disrespectful because it's... Um, I would go um, with that. Yeah. Post-fat, ex- post-mortem? It's a little more of a way to say it, but I mean, like, maybe they felt like changing Stan's image after he's been after he died would be in, in poor taste. That's a mm-hmm. good. I I would like to know. That's something I would love. To, good question. To to find out, like, was he originally de-aged 
So he looked like Stan from the 90s who, uh, reading the mall rat script or, um, was he, uh, was he not never part of the plan? And, uh, yeah. I mean, so officially Kevin Smith of it, it exists in the MCU. Which is crazy because that movie is based on Stan Lee's writing of Marvel Comics. Yes. So it's a cute joke, but when you think about it, your brain kind of melts. <laughs> hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, uh, that was great. That, that cameo. Um, no, and... the, the, the one, one other thing I wanted to mention was, uh, Agent Coulson being there. It, it, Marvel, again, always going just like a little bit extra, just putting a little bit of a, a, extra effort. And there's Coulson and you get to see like how, uh, Fury begins to really trust him when he lets him go in the stairwell. It's kind of a, it's kind of a motif that appears to this movie is disobeying or the soldiers disobeying orders. Oh, and, and, and that's, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, cause that was interesting too, because they do call him the new guy a couple of times. Um, yep. in the film. Um, but it's funny cause so along those lines, uh, not really along those lines, something else. So one of my coworkers brought this up and I, I agree with this point as well. Um, like, Marvel, okay. Yes. Like, if you're gonna, if you're gonna change her sex, why did you make her a waste of a character? In the sense of they they relegated Marvel to just being a Cree scientist, where Marvel is the first character in Marvel Comics who ever defeated Thanos and was you know like the greatest Cree warrior. So it was like. Well- Different, different movie again. And she wasn't a waste because she's the one that set up this whole thing. Well, no, to no, no, save because the, in the, in the sense they kept by, they act by, by there being an accident that gives her powers, uh, gives Carol Danvers her powers. They kept in a way the, the origin of Carol Danvers the same as the comics, but you know, they changed, but like why Marvel wasn't a, a warrior was like well, that just doesn't make sense you know like then why bother changing her to a woman like it you didn't use the character beyond um anything and it felt like who's the actress who played her it's uh, Annette Benning. yeah it almost mm-hmm. felt like well we got Annette Benning, so let's just make this work well you Count- do have to use your Annette Benning really well while you've got her just- counter counterpoint <clears throat> it's not marvell's movie two in the comics, yeah. Marvel leaves the Cree, like the very first Captain Marvel books from the sixties. Marvel leaves the Cree because he learns what they truly are. And yeah, it is more of a war thing, like he becomes a warrior. But um, I don't know. It was Mar. I mean, other than but why couldn't like why couldn't she still have been a warrior? Like why? You know what I'm saying? She was still a scientist who, um, I mean, she was still. Like yeah, she was just a scientist. I was gonna say still working for the crew, but she wasn't. She was secretly working on something to help the scrolls, which we can get into all that. Uh, Let's uh, keep, that's Let's a whole other podcast. Um, I don't know. Like I'll write it off to we don't know what happened before. Maybe she was a warrior that just got tired of fighting. Like she says, she wants to end wars. People want to end wars that work damn yeah, for the system. Traditionally, are people that are tired of fighting. Yeah. So, I mean, like, to be fair, I get where you're coming from on this, but it's not her movie. Yep. And I actually like it because there's a little bit of a fake out. We all, I think a lot of people assumed that Jew Law was going to be Marvel, and it wasn't. It's kind of a surprise. I looked at my wife with jaw slacked when they revealed that. <laughs> no, I went, what? No, because I think they did reveal um, who Jude Law was before the movie came out, though. They probably did, but I mean, like, I just, I think a lot of people assumed he was going to be Marvel. Yeah. But I think it was kind of cool. Wound up being the villain. What'd you guys think of the, of the twist where the squirrels aren't the bad guys? I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> I, feel, I feel the same way. I don't because... know, how I feel about it. Well, knowing what we know about the Kree so far in this universe, it didn't really surprise me. <laughs> Well, my wife said that too. My wife doesn't read comics, but she loves these movies. She's like the whole time. She's like, aren't the Cree the bad guys? And I'm yeah. like, yeah, let's see where it's going. Because I assumed we would get the war. Well, 
Sorry, well, if, Rock, you, yeah. if you've if you've watched Agents of Shield, then you know that they damn well are the bad guys. Like they're just fucking but evil. Here's the thing, right? Like <laughs> there's been an assumption, and the other thing is we can't really can't go into Agents of Shield because um, they don't consider yeah. them part of the continuity anymore. But except, except that Agent Coulson was in this. I show. know, I know, but <laughs> but again, a lot of people they they argue that Coulson died in. Avengers, so... Joss Whedon swears by it. Yeah. Um, so the show doesn't count. But um, but there's also arguments that they only used the Kree because they couldn't use the scrolls because they thought they were saving the scrolls for a Fantastic Four movie. Because I don't know how the rights all were tied up with that. Um, I know Super Scroll was definitely tied to the well, Fantastic, yeah. Fantastic Four. Yeah. It has to. Yeah. So... Um, the way I wrote this off in my head, because I do want to see a secret invasion movie, was these scrolls are okay. Maybe not all of them, because even in even in Marvel, there are pockets of scrolls. <laughs> like like secret invasion specifically, you had your religious well, extremist sect of scrolls. And, right, and that's definitely a direction they can go because they can also go that like you can't sit there and say um, the entire Kree Empire is bad; just the right. ones raging war are bad, and. Right. Not all the scrolls were good, but these refugees uh, were good. You know, like yeah. you can definitely do that and, and get away with it. You can also say, and this might be why it was 25 years ago. Um, they built up an army and now they want to. And and since uh, Ronan was killed and the Kree Empire has been weakened because uh, Captain Marvel went after the Supreme Intelligence. Now they're building up their army and getting revenge That's for all the ways they were treated. Entirely possible. I do imagine that a Kree scroll a Kree scroll war of some sort has raged on these past quarter century. Um I just want to see a synchronization movie at some point. Yeah. That's just me. I like that story. See, and then that also comes into because that's another rumor is that secret invasion is where they were going and well, I I think everybody thought that until we found out the scrolls were the good guys. And remember when uh when Talos gets shot, I'm like, oh, the kid saw it. That's going to motivate him on Batman style to become a evil. Oh, no, he left. <laughs> I was like, oh, I was wrong about that. Like, it's unfortunately, sometimes us nerds try to try to see the, the links between everything rather than, like, just letting yourself get, like, into the movie sometimes. <laughs> right. This is very true. Like, wow. I think our own expectations limit us in some. And, and it's so weird because you get so excited to see this stuff. And then when it challenges your notions, you're like, wait a minute. That's not what it's supposed to be. But and who was that? Show. Who who was that to play that? Uh, ben Mendelsohn. Ben, yes. The bad guy, uh, Kranich from uh, Rogue One. Yes, I thought he was. Um, I I liked it. The, He's great. Which is like I don't want to like him. I know. He's uh, really good. Every scroll comic I've ever read, it's like no, no, I'm not allowed to like him. So like. I, you know what's kind of cool too is I like that they kind of showed the original scrolls, the Fantastic Four two, the cow, the, the cow scrolls, if you will, like the the simpleton scroll that she kind of fools when she's getting her mind read. Uh huh. Like I well, like those, that they you mean that. those those weird little little yes. ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Those, that's the original scrolls that show up in Fantastic <laughs> Four two. Oh yeah. yeah. So. so I thought that was I thought that was a nice little continuity thing, which made me think of uh, the scroll hamburgers and scroll killer crew. Um. Chance I can get to praise Grant Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So, so, so I think you know, like we're we're all saying, go see the movie. Um, it's not. I don't think it's a perfect movie. It's a it's a it's a movie worth going to see, but it's not a perfect movie. Um, but uh, I think we could wrap it up because we don't want to be a dead horse, and this is already an hour and a half into the show. So, let's uh, wrap it up like we always do. Go around final thoughts and give it a score. One out of ten. Um, uh, and we can start with JD. So, I'm not going to rate this one. I talked to my wife knowing this question was coming. And she was she really loved this movie. So, uh, I, I said to her, I said, Michelle, rate this movie for me. And she said nine. Nine stars. So, I'm not going to give any of my smart-ass normal answers. This movie connected for her because she loves superhero stories and didn't have any when she was growing up. And for uh, a woman in her 30s to, to, to feel this way about a character 
is beyond me at that point. So for my wife, eight star or nine stars. Okay. Hmm. John. Well, I, I see. I got the same feeling with this movie that I got with um, Black Panther, where it was just. Although I think it, I, I feel like this one's better than Black Panther because Black Panther felt like it was. <laughs> it, it was just. Yeah, I, I I actually disagree with that too. <laughs> I I don't I don't know. For, no, just hear me out. Maybe you can tell me how I'm wrong. But but no, the thing the thing is, it just Black Panther felt like you know the story was just so smooth and and just you know it, it was kind of formulaic and all that but it, but i mean the, everything everything was great you know this one felt more organic you know i uh, i mean it's 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 my it's the only way i can really like articulate it right now is that this one felt more organic to me and more real it was a way of saying it than black panther did um so you know i like i i invested more in the characters i i um i enjoyed seeing the banter i you know the jokes landed with me um so i i really think this is one of the, the better ones in the entire mcu i i can't and and it leads into endgame which um trying not to take into account, but it's kind of hard. So I, I mean, I'm going, I'm going with a nine on this one. Um, okay. Um, you can send your hate mail to John at superheroespeak.com because uh, I, I already have it redirected to you. If it comes because <laughs> Any, you know, anything with foul language and it goes redirected right uh, back. I, I definitely you are the glorious leader. You have to deal with that. I, I Definitely disagree. I feel Black Panther was a much more natural, organic movie um, than this. But yeah. I think Black Panther is a better made film. Yeah, uh, but I hear where you're coming from. Like Black Panther does follow the Marvel uh, tropes, for better word, more than this movie does. But I think I connect. I like Black Panther more. Yeah, no, I know. I, 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 I agree. Also, with, I, it, that's 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 part of what was in my head. Like, yeah, Black Black Panther was more technically well made. It just that this one is, you know, I connected you know, more. So, you know, but again, I just, I just got it. I just got it. I just got it. Damn it. Got, got what? Um, that's the problem. That is the problem with this movie. And it's why it feels more like a, um, phase one MCU movie than a current MCU movie. Thank you, John. For it does it does talk about like it. Kurt. Yeah, I agree with that. Because the villains in this are more mustache twirly than sympathetic, where they have made an effort in the later movies to make the villains a little more sympathetic. That's only recently, though. Only like the past four or five movies have been really doing pulling that off. Yeah, he's right. You're right. Well, Phase Three. That's that's really when they started doing it. I think. Yeah. Mm. So, so yeah. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you for, See, for that. But they, but they, they, they weren't inconsequential. You know, it's not, it's not like you could have replaced the, the bad guys in this, like that, that AI and the, the artificial intelligence and what's his name? Um, the, the, you know, the one who wanted her to fight with bare fists, even though she could just make him into a grease smudge. I love that. Um, scene. I know, me too. <laughs> But but I think you know well, that, that, that it, it was. wasn't like it wasn't like it wasn't like whatever the name of was of the dark elf in in Thor the Dark World. I mean, you know, you could have replaced that guy with with well, thing, basically a box of baking right. soda. It you would have been the same. But as I'm saying, like you can't sympathize with that villain. You can't sympathize with these villains because they're just showed can't. what. You kind of can, I mean, not sympathize, but you can understand that their motivations. And their motivations say, are they want to take over the universe and they're much twirling their mustaches while they're doing and they, it. And they, no, and they found a weapon and instead of destroying it, they were giving it a go but of trying to that's what I'm form saying. her into their No, no. no. What makes, but what makes it different though is we don't really, like the story, I should say we don't know, the story doesn't present them as the villains until True. the last yeah. third of the film. Right. So I think that's what, you're right. You're totally right. There's nothing sympathetic about these Kree at all. Mm -hmm. But what makes this work a little bit differently is we're not really... And their motivation really is just know. to be evil. Like, there's no... 
Uh, no, no, it's not. It's it's to continue their foreign policy, which is to rule over everything, which I'm told is a wonderful thing. <laughs> they were empire building, basically. I mean, isn't imperialism what we're all about? Like, don't we love that? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so, JD at superheroespeak.com. No, I, I, I agree with you, JD. I mean, I mean, uh, I, yeah, yeah. It's they. You could even if you didn't, you couldn't sympathize with them. You could understand the direction they were trying to go in. And they're wrong, and they're evil. But what makes them different is they're not. The story doesn't say, doesn't tell you that these are the bad guys, which is important. Like that's important in the story is to establish, you know, what stakes are and who the rivals are. And when you throw a, a curveball like that, it worked. It's an effective curveball. I think that's what makes it a little bit different. And it does make up for the fact that the villains, they ain't no killmonger. Ron, Ron Yogg is not a killmonger, you know? No, that that's a brilliant um, bad guy, definitely. Yeah. So anyway, I will give it, I'm going to say seven and a half capes. And again, yeah. it's not like I have nothing against Brie Larson. I have nothing against the character. I just feel like this, I didn't think the story was good enough to introduce her. You know, at this point, the MC, they have raised the stakes over and over again with these movies, and I just don't think they did it with this one. But, I think seven and a half is a fair score for how you feel about the film. Yeah. Yes. More I, than fair. I am trying to be as fair as possible to this movie. So. No argument. Yeah. So that being said, thanks for listening. And as always, don't let your cape get caught in the door. Have a good week. Yeah, I just felt like it. Sh if there, to me, there was minor tweaks they could have made that would have made this movie ten times better. Again, I think if it was a decade later and there was a little less fury being comedy relief at times, I think it would have been a better movie. I would have kept most of it the same. That's cool, and a little more connective tissue with her parents and her flashbacks and to her standing up to intelligence because they did, they brush over that all from the comics. They that's, that's hinting at her relationship with her father from the comics, which is her key motivator for her becoming uh Miss Marvel. And it's just like, well, why she joins the air force and everything. So it's like, they could have brought that in more. And then, so her standing up to the uh intelligence would have been a much more powerful scene. So yeah. Damn it, I said that after we were done. <laughs> <laughs>